Hi friends and welcome back to Be Gay Make History, a podcast focused on the LGBTQ community. If we haven't met yet, hi, my name is Joe Bushy and this is episode 2, The Women Who Led the Way. Last week I talked about where my passion for the history of the gay community came from, and it came from a realization that many of us who are millennial and younger don't actually know our history. And so I dived into learning as much of our history as I could so that I could share it with other people. A realization that I had pretty early on into my studying of the history was that much of the people who first stood up to fight were transgender women, people of color, and transgender women of color especially. My second realization was that those same people often go uncredited for what they did. Which, in all honesty, really shouldn't shock me, because if you know anything about American history, you know that much of it is whitewashed. But that's a topic for another conversation. If you study the history of the gay community in the United States, one of the first things you learn about is the Stonewall Uprising. And when we talk about Stonewall, one of the first conversations that always happens is the discussion of who started the uprising. There are three women who are credited with being the one that started the uprising. A biracial, butch lesbian named Stormy DeLaverie, a black trans woman named Marsha P. Johnson, and a Puerto Rican trans woman named Sylvia Rivera. Now, before we really dive into the history of Stonewall and of these women, it's an important time to remind you that much of gay history was passed on orally, which means that it can be prone to bias. And this also means that we won't have some of the fine details that we wish we would have. As I mentioned, much of the conversations that revolve around Stonewall now revolve around who gets credit for starting it. And I personally find this conversation frustrating because it takes these three women and reduces them to a single night and negates all the huge impact they had beyond Stonewall and that night. And so that is where we will focus on their impact and their lives after Stonewall. But to do that, we do have to go back and talk about Stonewall to give a little bit of perspective on what led them to be where they ended up. In the summer of 1969, the tension between the New York City police and the gay community had reached a breaking point. As it was illegal to show intimate acts with a same-sex partner in public, police would raid businesses that were known for catering to the gay community and in turn would respond in violence and brutality against those that they arrested. Everything came to a head in the early hours of June 28th when the police raided the Stonewall Inn. As things had been escalating, a raid of this kind wasn't really out of the ordinary, but what was was how the patrons responded to it. As the story goes, one of the patrons of the Stonewall Inn threw a shot glass or a brick or the first punch at their arresting officer. We don't really know which one it was, but we do know that the patron fought back against the violence that the police were enacting on them. And this in turn prompted the other detainees to fight back as well. And this bled out of the bar onto Christopher Street. And this fight back against the police brutality would grow to a six-day uprising that would, at its height, have 600 people actively protesting against the police brutality. And it would be the catalyst that would show other gay Americans that they could fight back for their rights. Marsha and Sylvia both acknowledged that they weren't the ones to start the uprising as they showed up after the uprising had started. They did, however, take on leadership roles in the consecutive nights of the protest. And we know that Stormy was inside the Stonewall when the uprising began, and she is the one most likely to fit the description of who started it, but she both denied and took credit as being the one who started it. And while we'll never truly know who started it, what these three women did afterwards is nothing but astonishing. Marsha P. Johnson was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey in 1945, and she would move to New York City after graduating high school in the 1960s and she would live there until her death in 1992. Her early years in the city were heavily focused on survival, oftentimes dealing with homelessness and relying on friends for places to stay, and having to rely heavily on sex work as a trans woman to make money. In those years, Marcia did what she had to do to survive, and not only for herself, but also for Sylvia Rivera. Sylvia and Marcia met in 1963, and they became immediate friends. Sylvia had ran away from home that year to escape the abuse from her grandparents for her gender choices. 
and Sylvia was only 11 when she ran away. It's terrifying to think about the idea of an 11-year-old trying to find their own way in New York City. Now, Marcia was 17 at the time that they met, but they immediately had a connection to the extent that Sylvia would go on to say that Marcia was like a mother to her. And when the events of Stonewall would happen several years later, it would change the whole trajectory of both of their lives. Now, prior to Stonewall, Stormy already was known as a personality in New York City. From being a trend-setting pioneer in the androgyny fashion industry to being the only drag king performer at the Jewel Box Review, she was known as one of the mainstays in the New York City gay scene, and she was also fiercely loyal and protective of the people she loved. And so her actions within the Stonewall Uprising are not surprising. It's what she would have done any other day to protect the people she cared about. The events of the Uprising and the unfortunate death of her partner of 25 years, Diane, would push her into activism, but on a smaller, more personal scale. Two months after the events of Stonewall, Stormy would retire from the Jewel Box Theater and would take on a bodyguarding role for wealthy families during the day, and she would be a bouncer at the Cubby Hole, a well-known lesbian bar in New York City. All three women would go on to have major impacts on the communities that they were part of. In the 1970s, Marsha and Sylvia would go on to found the organization STAR. STAR stood for Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. The goal of STAR was to bring protection to transgender people and their rights. And alongside of the organization STAR, they started what was called the STAR House, which provided shelter to transgender youth who had been kicked out of their homes and were experiencing homelessness. And because of their past, you can understand why this was an important goal for them. Stormy would go on to be described as a gay superhero and the butch cowboy of New York City. The reason behind this was because while she was a bouncer at the cubbyhole, she would patrol the lower sections of 7th and 8th Avenue with her gun on her hip, looking out for what she called the ugliness that many of the people of our community faced during the time. The ugly, of course, being the violence and brutality that many of the gay people in New York City experienced. And of course, it was common knowledge to not mess with her because she didn't put up with it. Another important thing to acknowledge at this point is that even though all three women had impactful roles within shaping gay history, the way their lives played out couldn't have been more different. And it really shows the disparity that the trans community experienced at the time. Stormy would continue to bounce at the cubbyhole and patrol the streets of New York City well into her 80s when she retired. Even after retiring, the owner of the cubbyhole continued to pay her a weekly salary. This payment was done in gratitude of what she had done for the community. And it would allow her guardians, as she aged and started to deal with dementia, to put her in one of the best elder care facilities in New York City. And it was the community giving back to someone who had loved them fiercely and put their own self at harm to protect them. And this is where she would spend the last years of her life until she passed away at 93. Now, I wish that I could say that Marsha and Sylvia's stories ended in the same way as Stormy's, but unfortunately, that's not how it happened. Shortly after the events of Stonewall, the GLF, or Gay Liberation Front, and GAA, the Gay Activist Alliance, would be created to push for gay rights. Marsha and Sylvia were both part of these organizations in their early days, but would not stay with them very long, as the leadership of these organizations were cis, white, gay men and women. And they actively tried to downplay what transgender people and people of color did during the Stonewall uh, Uprising, which is funny in a tragic way because it was the transgender people and the people of color who were the first ones and the largest groups of people at Stonewall, especially being that Stonewall catered to a majority POC patronage. Both women left the organizations and this is when they founded STAR. Now, this is the point where I wish I could say that the community rallied behind them but it didn't happen. Even after Marsha's role in the Stonewall Uprising, much of her adult life was spent still dealing with homelessness. She also continued to rely on sex work as a way to make money because it was one of the only ways that transgender women could at the time. 
Unfortunately, this led to her being abused by her customers, being arrested several times, and eventually contracting HIV in the 90s. And unfortunately, on July 6, 1992, her body was found floating in the Hudson River. Without so much as an investigation, the New York City police deemed her death as a suicide, which left her family and friends incredibly angry because there were clear signs that Marcia had been murdered. In 1992, the anti-gay hate crimes had reached an all-time high in New York City, and 18% of those crimes were reported to have been committed by police officers. Friends and members of the community came forward with evidence, and the police refused to follow the leads that had been brought forward. As they'd spent much of their lives together, you may be wondering where Sylvia was during all of this. Sylvia had moved away from the city to escape the life that she had been living after Stonewall. Like Marcia, she continued to experience homelessness throughout her adult life. She also dealt with substance abuse and at one point tried to commit suicide. Marcia had been the one to take her to the hospital and be there for her as she recovered. It was after her attempt at suicide that she moved away from the city. Shortly after Marcia's death, Sylvia moved back to New York City and found a city that had started to change. And she dived back into her activism. In 1997, using the Star House as her blueprints, she would open Transy House, which was a safe place for homeless transgender youth to stay when they were experiencing homelessness. And at the same time, she started to reconnect with the gay community that had turned their backs on her as they began to recognize the trans community and the people of color and their sacrifices and the work they put into advancing the gay rights movement. And in the late 90s and the early 2000s, she would be seen walking in the New York City Pride Parades and people would recognize her and shout her name and thank her for what she had done. And she would no longer be homeless as she had a permanent place at the Transy House. And with her partner, Julia Murray, at her side, she would pass away in 2002. All three women's legacies live on in the stories we tell and what we do to recognize them. Today in the lesbian community, Stormy is remembered for the love and bravery she put forward to, to protect the people in the community that she loved. And for her willingness to put herself in harm's way to protect them. Both Sylvia and Marcia are remembered in the foundations that were created in their name to advance the rights and protections for transgender people. And with prompting and push from the community and Marcia's family, Marcia's case was reopened and reclassified from suicide to drowning with cause unknown. And the DA of New York City at the time acknowledged that the case would be continued to be investigated and at its current place it is still a cold case but open in New York City. All three women are recognized in awards, in monuments, in plays and music and art and documentaries and podcasts. And they're recognized as symbols of the strength of our community and as reminders that we need to protect all members of our community. And that is the story of the three women that were at the forefront of the fight for gay liberation. Now, all sources for this episode will be listed in the episode documentation, but I really urge you to do your own research into these women because there is only so much that I can put into a podcast. Let my story be the springboard to your own research to learn more about them. And come back for episode three, where I will be talking about three events that happened prior to Stonewall that set the stage for Stonewall to become the catalyst. And as always, I close every episode with a reminder that you living and thriving as a member of the LGBTQ plus community is making history. So keep doing that shit. Mm -hmm.